This video will contain spoilers for Jujutsu Kaisen chapters 117, 118, 119, and the first couple pages of 120, and season 2, episode 17, otherwise known as episode 41. <laughs> So the second season of Jujutsu Kaisen is still thundering, and in this series I'm going to be analyzing the story of the series as it airs and, as a manga reader, comparing the anime to the manga to see what they pulled over directly, what they modified or expanded, and what they just straight up removed. So let's begin with the 17th episode of Season 2 of Jujutsu Kaisen. First, I'll recap the plot and explain what chapters it covered. The episode begins with Megumi explaining the Ten Shadows technique to Blonde Shithead, which probably makes it stronger. Blonde Shithead thinks he's going to die on his own as he falls over, but Megumi continues explaining. Basically, the Ten Shadows technique starts with the wielder and their two divine dog Shikigami. Together, they can summon the other nine Shikigami, the divine dogs count as one, in an exorcism ritual. And as long as the Ten Shadows user or their Shikigami is the one who exercises the target of the ritual, they will unlock that Shikigami for later summoning. He points out, however, that you can involve other people in the ritual, but the effect is nullified afterwards, meaning the Shikigami won't be unlocked for the user to summon. He thinks back to a conversation he had with Gojo once, where Gojo told him that in an earlier era of history, A head of the Gojo family and a head of the Zenin family killed each other in a battle in front of the aristocracy. He told Megumi that the Gojo family head was a limitless user with the six eyes, just like him, and the Zenin family head was a ten shadows user, just like Megumi. Back in reality, Megumi remarks to himself that despite the implication, he doesn't believe he could become as strong as Gojo, and that the Zenin family head probably did what he's about to do to win. He's briefly interrupted by Jogo's meteor impacting nearby. But Megumi continues. He explains that you can summon the Shikigami at any time to attempt to exercise them, but the one he's going to summon right now has never been defeated by any Ten Shadows user. As Blonde Shithead connects the dots and realizes what's happening, Megumi finally completes the summoning incantation he started several times at this point, but never completed until now. He summons the strongest Shikigami of the Ten Shadows technique, Eight-Handled Sword Divergent Sila Divine General Mahoraga. Note, in the original Japanese, they use the term Makora, so if you hear them say that and wonder why the subtitle is different, that's why. It appears with a procession of the other Shikigami of the technique heralding its arrival. Megumi mentally apologizes to Yuji, assuming he's going to die, and lets Blonde Shithead know he's pretty much on his own, before being swatted like a fly by Mahoraga, crunching against a shutter for a nearby shop, bleeding profusely from his head, just like we saw at the end of the previous episode. We cut away to Skuna and Uraume, with Skuna noticing something is amiss with Megumi, and tells Uraume not to neglect their preparations, and that he'll soon be completely free. Just as Mahoraga is about to make Blonde Shithead one with the street below his feet, Skuna swoops in and saves him, pulling him away and landing next to Megumi. Skuna immediately clocks the situation, recognizing that Megumi started an exorcism ritual with Mahoraga and pulled in Blonde Shithead. He notes that Megumi is in a state of suspended death, meaning he's not actually dead yet, but will die as soon as the exorcism ritual is over, which means it was a good idea to save Blonde Shithead because if he had died, so would have Megumi. Skuna hits Megumi with some of that reverse curse technique Kuraga magic and says he needs him to do something and can't die yet. He silences Blonde Shithead and tells him to stay out of the way while squaring up to take on the Shikigami, knowing he has to defeat it as an outsider to void the ritual and keep Megumi alive. He approaches Mahoraga, ready to take a taste of his opponent. Mahoraga takes a swing at Skuna with his sword arm, and Skuna blocks it, but seems to notice something is off with it, so dodges out of the way and hits it with one of his slicing techniques, Dismantle. Skuna notes that Mahoraga's blade is specialized for fighting cursed spirits, and is enveloped in positive energy that would instantly shred a cursed spirit, which means it's a good thing he's not one of them. The wheel above Mahoraga's head spins, its wounds heal, and it stands back up. Skuna notices it did something and sends another dismantle its way. This time, 
Maharaga deflects it before it lands. Skuna is surprised, noting that it can see his attacks. It takes another swing at Skuna, which he blocks, but is surprised to find it hits much harder than he expected, sending him flying at high speed through several buildings. The two engage in a scuffle, ending with Skuna hitting it with another slash. He watches to see what happens. The wheel spins, Mahodaga stands again, and its wounds heal. Skuna remarks that it's just as he expected, comparing the Shikigami to Yamata no Orochi, a mythological creature in Japanese Shintoism. Skuna explains that the summoning incantation for Mahodaga, known as Furu's Incantation of the Ten Sacred Treasures, the analysis section of this video is going to be a doozy and my hands already hurt imagining typing the script for it all. And the wheel above its head represent a complete cycle and harmony, meaning that Mahodaga's ability is to adapt to any and all phenomena it encounters. He notes how it adapted to his attack, allowing it to see his slashes, and how it adapted to his resistance to positive energy and instead used cursed energy when it hit him the second time. He thinks if it was the version of Skuna we saw Megumi fight back in Season 1, it might have been able to beat him. He thanks Megumi for showing him the way, and whips out his domain expansion. At this point, we get a little more info on Skuna's technique. He has two kinds of slashing attacks. The standard slash, known as Dismantle, and a second slash known as Cleave, which can be adjusted based on the target's toughness and cursed energy level to cut them down with one attack. We also learn about his domain expansion, Malevolent Shrine, which is unique from other domain expansions in that it doesn't enclose a barrier to project itself onto, which is akin to a painter painting their masterpiece on air instead of on a canvas. Due to the lack of a barrier, Malevolent Shrine leaves an escape route, which forms a binding vow that allows Skuna to vastly increase the range of the domain's guaranteed hit effect, up to 200 meters which is about 656 feet in freedom units, or the size of King Kong standing on top of the Space Needle for a practical example. That being said, he took Megumi's position into account and narrowed the range down to 140 meters, 459 feet, about 10 feet longer than a cruise ship, in a dome type shape to leave the ground intact and to make sure Megumi was outside the range. We see as everything within the range is shredded, buildings, people, and all. Until Malevolent Shrine is dismissed, it relentlessly attacks everything within its range, using Cleave on anything with Cursed Energy and Dismantle for everything else. Mahoraga takes a myriad of slashes, while the entire area of Shibuya and everyone in it is practically obliterated. Skuna notes that the only way to defeat Mahoraga is to exercise it in a single attack it hasn't seen before. He notes, however, that if it had adapted to slashing attacks instead of Dismantle specifically, it would get back up. It begins regenerating, confirming for him that it adapted to the phenomena of a slashing attack, not specifically the dismantle attack. Before it can get back up, he repeats the fire arrow attack he used on Jogo, but this time apparently at a much higher intensity, as it creates a giant pillar of fire that shoots up into the sky, like when Sephiroth uses that stigma attack in Kingdom Hearts 2. We cut back to Blonde Shithead, standing at the edge of the devastation, looking on in awe. Skuna wanders back, throwing Mahoraga's wheel onto the ground like a trophy. As it dissolves, Skuna commands Blonde Shithead to be gone, and he's happy to oblige. He runs towards the devastated area, and we finally get his name, Shigemo Haruta, which I refuse to use, and an explanation of his technique. It isn't given a name, but effectively it takes small everyday miracles, like seeing the clock hit 444 and 44 seconds and erases them from his memory while storing them up. The marks under his eyes indicate how many of these stored miracles he has left, and they're used when his life is in danger to keep him alive, though he's not even aware of that. As he runs, acting smugly about getting to live another day, we get the sweet satisfaction of watching him get coronally bisected. Turns out, Nanami had used up the rest of his miracles, meaning his meeting with Skuna was the end of him. Skuna's hand shakes and he notices he doesn't have much longer. He uses his insane speed to quickly drop Megumi off at the field hospital with Shoko and the principal, who questions whether he just saw Yuji or Skuna. Back at the site of the devastation, Skuna hands control of the body back over to Yuji, telling him to feast his eyes on the destruction his flesh has wrought. As the memories of what Skuna did when he was in control flood Yuji's mind, 
he has an emotional meltdown, falling to his knees, vomiting, the whole nine yards. He struggles with feelings of wanting to die, and how continuing to be allowed to live only brings death and destruction for others, before eventually regaining his composure enough to push himself to move and fight. Otherwise, all the destruction he just failed to stop Skuna from causing will mean he's nothing more than a murderer. Elsewhere nearby, the somehow still alive, barely hanging on Nanami, deliriously stumbles through the station, his left half basically munched gristle, and the episode ends. With the recap out of the way, let's go over the main points of the plot. 1. Outside Shibuya 109, a wounded Megumi is cornered by blonde shithead, and decides to finally use his attack of summoning the strongest Shikigami of his technique, Mahoraga, which no one has ever tamed. 2. Megumi is put in a state of suspended death pending the outcome of the ritual, which Skuna takes advantage of to heal him, and resolves to complete the ritual himself to keep Megumi alive, since he has plans for him. 3. Mahoraga's big ability is to adapt to any and all phenomena it encounters, limiting its opponent's options until victory against it is impossible. Skuna confirms this by reducing a huge chunk of Shibuya and everyone in it to dust, then nukes Mahoraga with a single overwhelming fire arrow attack to defeat it. 4. Blonde Shithead thinks he got away but gets his Jujutsu Kaisened by Skuna after all his miracles were used up against Nanami. 5. Skuna drops Megumi off at the Pokemon Center before circling back to Ground Zero and putting Yuji back in the driver's seat to feast his eyes on the destruction. Now let's get into some analysis. Ooh boy. There's a bit to get into with this episode. First, let's break down the big boy, Mahoraga. A lot of this information is going to come from a post from a few years back over on the r slash Jujutsu Shi subreddit made by the user Cindersnap. So shout out to them and the people they consolidated all this info from for figuring all this out. The first to probably catch your attention was that mouthful of a name. Let's take it one part at a time. First, Eight-Handled Sword. The Eight-Handled Sword, aka Eight Hands Long Sword, or Yatsuka no Tsurugi, is one of the ten sacred treasures given by Nigi Hayahi, a Shinto god. Eight is also a holy number in ancient Japan and China. Even in the modern day, the number eight and octagons are often associated with the emperor. Also, Skuna compares Mahoraga to Yamata no Orochi, a well-known serpent monster god in Japanese Shinto mythology that has eight heads. After some digging, the only conclusion I could come to as to why he does this is because there's a villain in One Piece, also associated with Yamata no Orochi, who can survive being beheaded eight times because his serpent form has eight heads, making Mahoraga similar in terms of being able to survive deadly blows like that. As I couldn't find anything anywhere stating Yamata no Orochi was known for adaptational or regenerative abilities in the original myths, but Yamata no Orochi is related to the Hydra from Greek mythology, which was able to regrow its heads, so maybe there's some mythological cultural cross-contamination going on there. Back on the topic of the name, next we have Divergent Sila. Sila could mean several different concepts. Sila in Buddhism comprises three stages along the Eightfold Path, right speech, right action, and right livelihood. Sila can also mean to guard against or boundary in ancient Chinese. Akutami has used ancient Chinese in other places, so it could certainly be in use here. Divergent can also mean odd, strange, curious, or different. So this part of the name could simply be referring to the Shikigami as a form of strange guard, or perhaps refers to its adaptational ability as a corruption of those three steps of the Eightfold Path of Buddhism. Finally, Divine General Mahoraga. In Japanese, the name Makora is used. Mahoraga is an interchangeable form of the name from Sanskrit. And Makora is the name of one of the twelve divine generals who protect the Buddha of healing and medicine in Mahayana Buddhism. If you look this guy up on the Jujutsu Wiki, you may see that, according to Wikipedia, Mahoraga are snake-like deities in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. These Mahoraga are not the same concept as Megumi's general Mahoraga. Regarding the wheel specifically, 
The Jujutsu Wiki claims that it represents the Dharma, which in Buddhism is the cosmic law and order, as taught by the Buddha. Interestingly, in Buddhist philosophy, the word Dharma can translate as a phenomena, which is why the wheel spins when Mahodaga adapts. In effect, you could say the wheel spinning is a visual representation of Mahodaga itself learning about the nature of reality as regards whatever phenomena it is adapting to, then changing the reality of its own form or abilities to counter it. So overall, the general theme with this guy seems to be drawing on Buddhist concepts to depict it as a sort of defender that can learn about things on the level of reality itself and then shift itself on that same level to become a perfect defender slash counter against any potential phenomena. The incantation used to summon it is also interesting. In Japanese, Megumi says Furube Yura Yura, which is translated into English in this context as With this treasure I summon. The Japanese used here is a reference to the Furu no Koto, a chant in ancient Japan that was used in attempts to resurrect the deceased. Furube has the kanji fu for fusen slash bujion, an ancient coin currency from China, as well as the kanji ryu for lapis lazuli or potentially any gem, and the rendaku afflicted particle he slash be. Rendaku, to keep it simple, is just a pronunciation rule that shifts the pronunciation of certain particles in Japanese to differentiate words in certain contexts from each other, and that particle indicates an action towards something. The two characters, Furu, can combine to create an idiom for wealth slash treasure. Yura Yura has the Manyogana, which is basically a really old way of writing Japanese from back when they first appropriated Chinese characters to use as a writing system, named after a poetry collection that was written in that system. Phonetic characters of the mimetic term for swaying, shaking, or ringing. The translation into English makes reference to the ten sacred treasures mentioned earlier, which interestingly, each one of Megumi's Shikigami seems to have been associated with one of these so far. There's also a lot of references to ancient history and language with this Shikigami in particular, perhaps indicating that it might be the oldest of the Shikigami in the technique, or just to show how far back the technique goes in history. Anyway, I think that's enough on Mahodaga for now. I can't really think of anything more to say about it at this point, to be honest. Next, let's just go over Skuna's domain expansion real quick. I've talked about it a bit before regarding the curtains slash veils and domain amplification, but I think this episode presents a good opportunity to reiterate how Skuna's domain works and how it differs from other domains, in case the explanation in the episode didn't make it click for you. Basically, the way domains work in Jujutsu Kaisen typically is that the caster uses a barrier technique like the ones used to create curtains slash veils to create a separate space from wherever it was cast, which we generally see from outside the domain as a black sphere that has enveloped everyone present. Once the barrier is in place, the caster then projects their domain onto the interior of the barrier, causing the interior to take on the appearance and properties of their domain, constructing everything physically out of cursed energy. In Jogo's case, this is the inside of a lava-filled fiery volcano, in Gojo's case, this was something like a black hole or maybe just somewhere out in space. And in Dagon's case, this was an ocean beach. The reason for this is the way the innate domain and innate technique interact with each other. Even those without innate techniques have an innate domain, a space inside themselves that reflects their inner world. This is pretty similar in concept to the inner worlds Zanpakuto create in the minds of their Shinigami in Bleach like the city Ichigo had with Zangetsu. Once the domain is injected into the barrier and the space created, the user then also injects their technique into the domain as well. You can almost imagine this as like being inside of a domain effectively means you are constantly surrounded by the caster's technique from all sides and in every direction. Or at least that's how I imagine it. This is what allows the guaranteed hit effect to function as the targets are effectively swimming in the caster's technique and it could act upon them from anywhere. Now, a domain that doesn't have a technique injected into it is considered an incomplete domain, even if a barrier is used. We saw this in Season 1 with the Finger Bearer at the Juvenile Detention Center. The Finger Bearer didn't have an innate technique, since it technically only became a special grade cursed spirit upon ingesting one of Skuna's fingers. 
However, it did have enough cursed energy because of this to expand its domain across the detention center and enclose it in a barrier that trapped the Yugumi Bada trio once they entered. This caused the interior to look all spooky and shit, but they were only in danger around the spirit itself, with the lack of a technique being injected into the domain. These barriers can also be deceptive in that they appear bigger on the inside than the outside, so even though you only see a black sphere of a particular size small enough to fit inside a sky bridge in Shibuya on the outside, for example, inside is a vast beach and ocean many times larger than could have fit outside the barrier. One final note is that aside from the guaranteed hit, the domain expansion also buffs the caster's technique, making it more effective inside their domain. Now, with all that explained, Skuna's domain seems crazy because it effectively breaks the rules of domain expansion. When he creates the barrier for his domain, he doesn't close it off with an outer shell, instead projecting his domain and infusing his technique into an open barrier. This differs from what Megumi does when he casts his domain, as when Megumi casts his domain he doesn't create a barrier at all, instead just directly projecting his domain onto the environment around him, and he also lacks the ability to infuse his technique into the domain as well, meaning he doesn't get a guaranteed hit effect from it either he solely gets just the boost in performance to his technique. Since Skuna doesn't enclose the barrier he uses to project his domain onto, he creates a binding vow that enhances and expands the range of his guaranteed hit effect in exchange for allowing a theoretical escape route to anyone fast enough to be able to move 200 meters in the time between Skuna casting the domain and the slashes coming. The only two characters I think could realistically pull this off would be Gojo or Toji, and even then they'd have to know that's how it works, because I'm sure Skuna wouldn't tell them. Once all that's done, Skuna has the ability to utilize his slashing attacks, Dismantle as a general use tool that deals less damage but can cut anything, and Cleave as a specialty tool that can only hurt targets with a minimum amount of cursed energy but can be scaled up to attempt to take the target down in one slash, on the environment around him to cause widespread devastation to literally everything within range of his guaranteed hit effect. This is important because if he enclosed his barrier, he'd only be able to hurt who slash whatever it was he trapped in the barrier, but because he doesn't, he can also score all those sweet collateral points killing the innocent civilians and destroying all the buildings around him so he can torture Yuji afterwards. Because Skuna is just a really swell guy. Finally, we'll go over the bonus pages from in between these chapters in the volume release of the manga. This week, we just have the other three parts of the Valentine's Day popularity poll. Since I've done a lot of talking in this video already, and I'm sure you're as sick of hearing my voice as I am, I'll give my voice a rest and provide you all with a moment of quiet reading and music for these. And that's my episode recap and story analysis for the 17th episode of the second season of Jujutsu Kaisen. Make sure to subscribe and turn on bell notifications if you want to be here as soon as possible each week, as I put out new videos for each episode as it airs. And feel free to drop a comment with suggestions as to other videos you might like to see, such as character analysis videos or explanations. Thanks for watching.